slides? Yep. Yes. Okay. So yesterday oh, it was a lot about weather. So we'll just do a very quick review of some, you know, key concepts here for you. So there was a lot in terms of meteorology. Um, without getting into all the details, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, the, the whole globe, you have atmospheric circulation. So generally this unequal heating of the earth is um, what kind of creates a lot of the weather patterns that we see. In terms of local wind patterns, those can be affected by local terrain, like mountains and water. These are things you know, so don't uh, forget things that you know just because you're talking about aviation, right? We know about lake effect snow when you're near a lake, so things like that um, affect the, the weather. And the weather also changes during the day in terms of the sun during the day heats up the air, causes a lot of turbulence, um, in the evening at nighttime tends to be a little bit more calm. There, when you think about stability, so um, when you want, you're talking about smooth air, um, basically you want sort of limited vertical movement. So whether you're talking about cirrus clouds up high, sort of lower stratus clouds, as, as long as the clouds um, have limited vertical movement, it tends to be stable air, so you won't get a lot of turbulence or bouncing around. I want to, I'll come to this in a few slides, but when we were talking about the weather at Hanscom in assignment yesterday, some folks were saying, okay, because it was overcast at 4,500 uh, later in the afternoon, um, does that mean it's unsafe to fly? Well, generally, you know, when you talk, talk about stratus clouds or overcast, those can actually be very pleasant days to fly. Um, you know, VFR means avoid going into the clouds, but just looking up at the clouds, if they look very flat and not moving much, tends to have less turbulence. If you look up in the air and you see a lot of bumpy clouds, that means the air is bumpy <laughs> and you're gonna get some turbulence. So being in the um, winter time in the Northern Hemisphere right now, please keep in mind icing, frost, these types of things are a big issue. So if you have the combination of the precipitation and humidity in the air and the below freezing temperatures, you can get this frost and icing and it can really affect your lift performance of your wing by having all kinds of bumps on the on the surface of the wing. So it really can affect the airplane significantly, so don't, don't take these things lightly. So here's a little bit of Latin for pilots that you saw in the lectures. So, so stratus clouds are kind of like a big sheet, so that's what we mean by, you know, they're pretty, they're kind of horizontal, there's not a lot of vertical movement. Cumulus are the puffy clouds, the bumpy clouds. That's usually where you get a little bit more turbulence. So I think it's pretty obvious that thunderstorms are not good for pilots. Um, you've seen these in your normal weather reports, so keep these in mind. You know, cumulonimbus, big tur turbulence, thunderstorms, lifting action, unstable air. These are these are big issues. Stay away from them. Okay, now I think we've talked about wake turbulence um, a few different times, but there's still a little bit of confusion in the homework. So I just wanna talk about it one last time. So again, behind an airplane, after the airplane flies through the air, there are these vortices that are generated. And as the airplane flies through the air, these kind of come behind the airplane and then they sink you know, with gravity down to the ground. And so if you, so let me just show you my, my little airplane here again. So if the airplane's flying and behind it, there's 
you know, turbulent air and that over time it's sort of sinking, then you can imagine as my hand is showing, this is where all the turbulent air is. So if you're an airplane that is coming in after this heavy airplane, you know, you want to be above it. If this airplane lands on the runway, you want to land ahead of it because if you land ahead of it, then you're not, you're not in this turbulent air that's behind the heavy aircraft. So it's, uh, that's kind of the real concept there. So we've, we've talked about this, uh, a little bit, I won't ask you again because we did this before. So when you're landing behind a large aircraft, you wanna, you wanna land um, beyond it or ahead of it so that you're not getting into that turbulence. So there was still a little bit of confusion there um, on the homework by some of you. For, are there any folks that are still confused that have further questions on this issue? Could you go back to that question? I think I had a, a problem with the word uh, beyond and before. Ah, okay. Yeah, the FAA can be confusing. This is a, an example FAA test question. So um, what did they mean then when they said before the large aircraft touchdown point versus beyond? Right, so if you think of a of a runway, um, what they're saying is if the, let's, let's pick a number. So let's say it's a 5,000 foot runway and the large aircraft uh, touched down on the runway at 2,000 2, feet down the runway. So landing beyond that would be landing at, you know, 3,000, at the 3,000 foot marker or the 4,000 foot marker. So beyond where the the aircraft had touched down. Before it would mean, um, you know, landing right at the, the runway threshold or run at the first thousand feet. If you land over there, then you're gonna have that turbulence um, over there. Now, of course, you can choose to go around. You can, you don't have to land right behind a large aircraft if you don't have enough runway distance. But in general, if you, if you, you know, land right at the, the runway threshold or in the first thousand feet, feet like you might be used to, but a large aircraft just landed ahead of you, you're going to get a lot of turbulence on your short final in your landing. Yeah, so uh, remember the jets, the instrument approaches, the pappies, uh, they always target the thousand foot markers, so a thousand feet down the runway. Um, and uh, therefore you can be pretty sure most jets uh, are fairly flown fairly precisely. You can be pretty sure the jet will touch down somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred feet down the runway. So before would be like at the five hundred foot markers, five hundred feet uh, from the runway threshold. So a lot of piston GA pilots, you know, like to land with a piston aircraft. You can uh, you can you know shoot for landing right on the at the beginning of the runway because you always have instant extra power available if you need it. Um, but uh, as Tina said, you know that's uh, still the, the larger aircraft or jet was uh, still 50 feet high uh, when coming in over the runway threshold. Um, at controlled, at towered airports, of course, they, uh, they try to space you out. They're not, they're not gonna have you land immediately after a Boeing 757. Um, but uh, I, yeah, I've only gotten to wait turbulence once at Hanscom Field because there was, there was a heavy med flight. I think a Sikorsky S-76 helicopter in front of me um, and uh, the tower didn't bother to separate us, me and the Cirrus. There's no standard, for, I think, for separating helicopters and little airplanes in the air traffic control book, um, but the helicopters can generate some significant weight turbulence. So I got kind of a sharp uh, roll in the, uh, to the airplane, maybe uh, 100 feet off the ground, 50, 50 to 100 feet off the ground. Okay, I'm glad we got to spend a little bit more time on that. Um, okay, so with weather, there are weather reports. So those show the actual current weather conditions. And then there are forecasts. And it's important to understand for any given source of information, which it is that you're looking at. Because, you know, forecasts can change. Um, you know, they could forecast that it'll be 
sunny and clear and winds calm, but the um, you know the actual reality when you get there could be that it's 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 a you know an issue, and so you need to really keep in mind the difference as you're looking at that data. So there are a lot of acronyms used in the METAR, and one of them uh, was Drizzle. Uh, almost 100% of you guys got that one correct. So here are a couple other acronyms. So then uh, the focus was really, what is the weather like at Hanscom? So there were a lot of different uh, answers there. So let's let's talk about it, talk it through. This is a snapshot that I had taken yesterday um, about, you know, shortly after class, looking at what the METAR report was here. And so from this, you know, from this particular reading, you see that they show visibility and that that P just means greater than, so greater than six statute miles. If you called into the, the ATIS and got the live report, um, they might say uh, visibility 10 statute miles. And then here it, ta it talks about a ceiling of 12, at least 12,000 feet above ground level. And there are some few clouds here. So let's, let's dive in a little bit to what some of these are talking about. So the ceiling, it's really important that ceiling doesn't just mean any clouds. So a ceiling is the, the lowest level of either broken or overcast clouds. So um, some of you did, had answers where you had cited, you know, scattered or few, oh sorry, the broken, the broken is okay, so that's just an error there. Um, so, so if you had scattered or few, um, those are, that's not actually representative of a ceiling. So there's, there's, um, if you need a certain ceiling in order to fly for VFR and there are a few clouds, that doesn't affect you. Now you should obviously be aware of those clouds. You should make sure to avoid the clouds if you're doing VFR flight, but it's not a ceiling and even scattered is not a ceiling. Um, so early, in the early afternoon, it seemed like at Hanscom, things were, were pretty clear. So either sky clear or the ceiling was at least 12,000 feet above ground level. You know, these were some good answers. Later in the afternoon, it looks like, um, you know, a ceiling developed close around 5,000 feet. So there was overcast, broken. So there are a couple different answers there um, that all would have been considered correct. Any questions about the ceiling? So scattered scattered clouds was not scattered uh, zero three zero was not a ceiling. Correct. The idea being that you know fewer scattered clouds, you know, kind of come and go. You could easily you know um, avoid them. You could um, choose to kind of fly around them and so it doesn't prevent you from flying if there's just a couple clouds around. Can we see another METAR example? Um, there were a bunch in the lecture slides. I'm not sure if I have another one here. What is the, what are you looking for in terms of a question? Uh, just to read a METAR. What is the 1312 over 1412 there? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about the, the METAR. This was um, discussed a little bit more in the lectures, but I agree that it is it is confusing. So why don't we go from the, this, from the beginning? So the very first uh, thing you see there is the airport identifier. So that's KBED. And then the next thing you see is the date and the time. So the, the 13 is referring to the, the date, so the 13th of, of January. And then when you look at the time, they give you the time in UTC or time in Zulu. And so depending on whether we're on daylight savings time or not, uh, you usually subtract four or five hours to convert that to the local time. Um, then the next, the, the next two numbers, um, okay, so that goes through the time in Zulu. So 
The next two numbers talk about, um, you know, from when is this valid? So you can see, for example, so the, I guess there are two different things here that, that are printing out. Um, on the screen you see right now, the top one is the METAR and below that are the forecast periods. So um, that's where you see kind of like the, the from time, so the, the FM number. These are all tabs on the page. Yeah, so if we, I'm trying to, if I, I think I'm not sharing my, I'm sharing the slide, I'm not sharing my screen where I'm on aviation weather. Can you guys see my? We see the slide. Can you see, can you see aviation weather now? Is that no. Is 1312 and to 1412, is that for like the tomorrow, the next day? I, I found that very confusing. The slide, guys, we're looking at the slide, I think. Yeah, but the slide still has a the slide is our text that I'm confused about how to interpret. So if we can interpret it, that'd be great. Now we see your browser, Tina. Tina, if it's okay with you, I can share one of my screens here. Um, go oh, go got... ahead, Philip. Okay. Uh, actually, I'll pick the same one as you. So we're sharing, you guys all see my uh, Aviation Weather Center screen, right? Yes. So yeah, where are we interested in? Looks like KHSE has some ugly weather down there. And it looks like KGRB, um, Green Bay. And let's look at K Burlington, Vermont, because I was gonna go pick up a uh, angel flight patient there the other day. Ah, thank you government. HSC, KGRB, KSAW, KBTV. Okay, let's have a look. Most recent only, let's do raw. We could do decoded too, but let's do raw for fun. Okay, so HSC at 14, uh, 15. Um, <clears throat> sorry, on the 14th day, which is today, uh, at 1551 Zulu which is uh, about half an hour ago. Automated weather, uh, wind was from 290 at six knots, seven miles of visibility, overcast 700. So this is a perfect, this is perfect weather for a single pilot with a fresh instrument rating because the minimums are usually 200 feet AGL. And here we have uh, clouds 700 feet over the airport. So we're gonna have, if you're, if your Cirrus or whatever is going down five to 600 feet per minute, we're gonna have at least a minute to uh, be out of the clouds, making the decision as to whether it makes sense to uh, continue the landing. Right, so, sure. so they were, the question that they had was about that forecast period. So if you check include TAF, the terminal area forecast, then you'll see the, um, no, no, right under me. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So now you see um, that, so where it says like 14, 16 slash 15, 12. I think that was the question that you have. And the yeah, reason, so it's, yeah, that's yeah. saying the forecast time frame. So when the forecast is valid for. Yeah, so it's saying that this last block here from the 15th at five Zulu, the wind's gonna be a little bit nasty, gusting 15 knots, light snow showers, that that's good until, uh, 12 o'clock Zulu on the 15th as well. So that, that just gives you <clears throat> the ending time, uh, ending valid time for that last, uh, whatever the last uh, line of the TAF is. Let's see what else is interesting here, if there's anything interesting here. So just to clarify, sorry, J just to clarify, that's saying on the 14th day from 1600 Zulu to the 15th day at 1200 Zulu, correct? Correct. Okay, cool. Thank yeah. You. Thank you for the extra time on this. Yeah, don't ask me what this means. <laughs> sea level pressure, 102. I think that's in millibars or something. Uh, these are remarks for Burlington. Uh, as a pilot, what you really care about, it's overcast 4,400. That's pretty good. And the temperatures too. So if you built up any ice on your airframe, 
you might be able to um, have it melt off, um, you know, in the last uh, thousand feet of your flight. So that's encouraging as well. Um, those are some good things to see. Whereas over here, uh, yeah, Green Bay, it's only one degree out, broken uh, 1,200. So I don't know. That's a little bit dicey as to whether you'd uh, actually get the ice off your airframe if you did build it up. All right, Tina, you want to take back over the screen? You said that overcast 700 feet was good for VFR flying. I thought... Uh, overcast 700 is good for uh, somebody who's single pilot with a fresh uh, instrument rating. So, you know, 200 feet is the FA minimum usually for a precision approach. That's great for a two pilot crew. Uh, and maybe it's good if you're an experienced instrument pilot and you just did some practice. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I don't like to go down to the FA minimums if I'm by myself and I haven't been flying instrument approaches. Uh, one after another in the last week. The FAA minimums are set up for, uh, you know, a two pilot crew that's very sharp. All right, tomorrow we're gonna tell you a little bit about minimums and in particular setting personal minimums, which I think are really important. And your personal minimums um, can depend on, you know, how recently you flew, um, a lot of different conditions to decide that. Um, so in terms of sources of weather information, and a lot of you, guys shared, you know, aviationweather.gov, used for flight. These are great tools. But don't forget the normal way that you figure out the weather, right? If you're trying to figure out whether to take an umbrella to work with you, um, you, can, you can look up your normal weather apps, your um, weather.com, these types of sources to supplement your overall understanding of what you're talking about, right? So you want to get to know what the what the weather is like so before you start diving into the details of okay is the wind gusting or do i have a crosswind it's a good idea to just get a big picture of what the weather is like you know are we talking about thunderstorms or are we talking about a generally nice day and so you can you know just like this this gives you a good sense that Earlier in the day, it was, um, you know, it says sunny, it's not really cloudy, but later in the day, there are going to be clouds developing. Okay, so that's a good big picture context to now dive in and get more detailed weather information. Um, also on aviationweather.gov, before you go into the METAR section, you can get kind of a big picture look. And these uh, blue dots indicate IFR conditions. Um, purple is like marginal IFR. Um, so you can see kind of the the where where there might be bad weather coming in, but right now um, at this time, which was right after class yesterday, it looks pretty clear over Massachusetts. You can also look at um, sky vector. So a lot of folks on the Discord were asking about how how to use sky vector and how it works. Um, so it's the same picture. This is this is still showing uh, Massachusetts, and this is the little boot, and so kind of you can see Boston over here and what this is the green dots are showing VFR weather conditions so overall it looks pretty good it also alerts you of things like this red dot if you zoomed into it it would show a no fly zone basically um, a temporary flight restriction over flying in certain areas so these are good to get kind of a general sense of, okay, right here, it's looking pretty clear. There is some bad weather uh, farther away. You know, how fast is that moving in? What's the issue? It's a great, great kind of big picture way of understanding what's going on. You, um, I saw almost no, nobody listed this as a method of how they got the weather. And I actually recommend it, um, especially if when you're actually going flying, and you have a route, right? So you're not just, yes, you're taking off from Bedford, but you might be going somewhere. Well, if you call um, this number, you can actually speak to a live person. You have to provide a fair amount of information, like what your tail number is, where you're taking off from, when you're planning to depart, how long you'll be in route, where you're planning to land. But they can um, get gather a whole bunch of data for you and tell it to you um, to give you a good brief on everything that's going on. So they tell you the local weather at the airports you're talking about. They tell you the overall terminal area forecast. They tell you if there are flight restrictions along the way, if there are, um, you know, pyreps, if there are um, 
you know, a, if there's a crane that's blocking something or if there's a, a lighted tower where the light is out, you know, they tell you a lot of information that, you know, parachute jumping in the vicinity, you know, these types of things, um, they give you a pretty comprehensive look as to what's going on. So I think it's a great idea, especially if you're doing a cross-country flight. And then um, those are all sources of information you could get ahead of the flight. There's a whole section in the lecture talking about whether you can get during the flight. Um, and there are many sources, but I just wanted to highlight one, which is uh, you can actually, if you know some if you have a very very fancy aircraft maybe you already get this built into your system but if you are like me flying you know a Cessna 172 um, you might want to get pick up that weather data yourself so there's actually something you can build yourself an ADSB receiver that uh, gives you know weather and traffic data and it can sync into your, um, you know, your ForeFlight app on your iPad, for example. And so it's a pretty helpful tool and it's a good idea to um, have that if you want as a, an additional source of weather during flight. Um, we mentioned a lot of apps or a lot of different ways to get weather and I think the best the best recommendation I can give is to use multiple sources. So very, very many of you indicated only a single uh, source of weather data when you looked for the weather at Hanscom. So I recommend you use multiple sources uh, to get to look at that. So then uh, comes to that question. I had one mandatory question that you had to answer in the homework, which is, was it safe to fly VFR, visual flight, uh, from Bedford? Um, so let's talk about this. You know, most, most of you said yes, which I, I agree with, but there was a little bit of, of confusion and hang up. So let's talk about it. So VFR weather minimums. Now, again, you can have your own personal minimums, but would it have been safe according to the FAA? So um, Bedford has got the class Delta airspace, so kind of zooming in there. So if you're just flying in and around uh, that airport, what are the requirements? Well, you basically have um, three statute miles of visibility and you need to be kind of away from the clouds. The clouds need to be at least a thousand feet above you. So that's actually a lot lower than I think a lot of you realized. So let me give you some examples of answers that some of you gave for what the weather was like. So um, this was an example for, for what one of you guys summarized the weather to be at Bedford and you know this shows that the the cloud there's some scattered clouds at 4500 but the, the ceiling is pretty high this is this is an acceptable VFR uh, you know people should should be comfortable flying VFR this was something you know a very similar forecast here instead of over uh, instead of scattered it became overcast at uh, the same height 4,500 feet, but a few of you who answered an answer like this said no, that it's not safe to fly, and the, the citation is basically because it's overcast. So it's okay, because 4,500 is, is high enough. You could, you could take off, you could fly the traffic pattern at Bedford, which is about, you know, 1,200 feet. Your cloud, the clouds aren't even very close to you. They're 3,000 feet above you, so that's well within the VFR minimums if you wanted to fly and you can you know of course go up to to 3,500 feet and still have a thousand feet above you before the clouds so this this would be a fine day um you know there wasn't a lot of um the the clouds weren't didn't have a lot of turbulence or, or movement they were pretty calm so i think it actually would have been a good day um, someone else cited that it would not be safe to fly because uh, there were showers in the vicinity. That's kind of an interesting one. Um, <laughs> showers obviously, you know, you might just choose not to fly during showers, but some some light showers actually don't <laughs> prevent you from flying a VFR, which is kind of funny. It can be raining a little bit as long as the visibility doesn't get impeded. So if you have some, you know, light scattered showers, um, you can avoid them or fly through them with a lot of, without a lot of issue, uh, you don't have freezing concerns, it might actually still be fine um, to, to fly with those conditions. So any questions about the, um, in particular, the weather at 
Hanscom yesterday and whether it would be safe to fly? So in your limits, there was a 500 feet limit. Uh, in one place it said 500 feet and another said 1,000 feet. Who was the 500? 500 below clouds, 1,000 above. Oh. Right. Yeah, I think this picture shows it a little better. So um, if you if you look at this uh, little little airplane, so it's showing that there can be a cloud 500 feet above you. And it says you can actually fly over clouds <laughs> um, to have clouds a thousand feet below you. Now, there are a lot of reasons why it's not a good idea as a as a VFR pilot to fly above clouds. Um, it can be disorienting. You're going to watch uh, some lectures today that talk about human factors and some issues. So it, it can confuse you. It can be dangerous. Some flight schools ban it. But technically, you know, if you have a layer of, you know, of clouds and then there's a gap where there are no clouds and then another layer of of clouds higher above, you know, you can fly in between two layers of clouds. And as long as you're far enough away from the clouds, uh, that's still safe, according to the FAA. So if the ceiling is 4,500, I could fly at 4,000. Right, exactly. Isn't it a good idea to have some instrument flight uh, knowledge, even if you are flying VFR? Because sooner or later, I think uh, something will happen and we'll hit a cloud or so, some, somehow we're, we're going to get delayed and it's going to be dark outside. Wouldn't, uh, be a, wouldn't it be a good idea to have a, like a minimal knowledge of uh, instrument flight? Yes, 100%. I'm a huge advocate for it. Um, I think, I think, uh, I think you're a safer pilot if you know how to fly instrument. And, you know, yes, you could get caught up in weather. Um, you can technically fly at night without an instrument rating in the United States. Um, but it is, you know, it's some, you know, it's not, it's not considered safe in other countries. So I would, I would just argue that, yes, you will be a safer pilot if you get your VFR rating. And even the first, you know, big section of VFR flight, even if you don't learn all the procedures, is just to, to fly more precisely. So to learn um, that if you're, you know, if you're flying at 3,000 feet, you know, that's your altitude, how to stay at 3,000 feet. You know, a lot of VFR pilots are, you know, sort of around 3,000 feet, but they could be, you know, plus or minus 500 feet, not really paying attention. Whereas if you're an instrument pilot, you got to be a lot more exact and precise about your flight, you know, your heading, you know, actually be stay on your heading and not wander off. Um, yeah, re remember, you get three hours of instrument training by regulation as part of your private certificate. You're not going to learn to fly an approach down to the 200 foot minimums, but you're going to learn how to get into a cloud uh, simulated with a hood on and uh, make a 180 degree turn to get back out of the cloud at a minimum. So uh, you'll, you'll never be pilot in command in the United States at least unless you've had uh, <clears throat> that three hours of hood time. Awesome, thank you. So now talking a little bit about seaplanes, which is one of the other uh, lectures from yesterday. These are pretty cool. Um, some call them floats. There's a fly-in, and uh, Philip updated the link here. So there's a fly-in in Maine um, every September just for seaplanes. So they have, you know, a lot of lakes. You can, there's some programs where you can actually just go up to Maine in a week. If you have your private pilot's license and you just want to get your seaplane rating, you can go up and learn that in a pretty short amount of time. There's, there's a great guy in Alabama, too. So email me if you want to... Um if you want uh, a reference there, a Gulfstream pilot friend of mine uh, found a great seaplane school and instructor down in Alabama. If, if you're flying one of those uh, 1930s Piper Cubs on floats, you won't be worried about COVID, let me tell you. <laughs> and uh, as I said in my uh, lecture, which I think you watched, the, uh, the, problem, one, the big problem with seaplanes is you have no idea what's in the water.
So the, you know, the lecture obviously covered it more comprehensively, but I'll just highlight some things. So um, some things that it's a bad idea to do in a seaplane. So um, talks a little bit about that and some issues. There's some, a lot of dangers that can occur. And so you have to be careful, make sure that you're, um, so sometimes those floats uh, actually have wheels that come down. And so you need to make sure to pull up the wheels so you have a nice, uh, nice float. But you'll learn a lot of really cool things if you get your seaplane rating. So, you know, how to evaluate the size of the lake, how to determine the wind direction, right? So there's not, there's not going to be a stick in the middle of the lake with a wind sock on it. So you have to look at the water to estimate where the wind is coming from. Because like we talked about um, before, it's really important to land into the wind, right? It really, really is a a tailwind can can make it very disastrous so you you need to know where the wind is coming from um, so you'll learn a lot of really cool things uh, to get your sea pilot seaplane rating any questions about the seaplane lecture so landing in an airplane with that doesn't have a retractable gear landing in, in water is basically impossible Philip, you're muted. I could barely hear. I mean, it's something about landing a regular airplane with with no floats in the water. I mean, you got to speak up. Landing an airplane with with uh, that doesn't retract its gear in in in, in water, like Sully, Captain Sully, is just a terrible idea. You can't. There's no way you could do that if you can't retract the gear. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's why the Cirrus is good, right? Because yeah. most fixed gear airplanes, uh, they will flip over if they, even if you do a perfect landing. So uh, Cirrus is actually uh, better than uh, other fixed gear airplanes because you'll, you'll, in an emergency, you'll uh, smash down into the water under the parachute. I wouldn't say float down. It's a pretty, you know, it's like six or 700 feet per minute minimum. Um, so uh, you're smashing down into the water, but that's still better than uh, hitting the water and flipping over. The retracts, um, actually somebody was asking about Matt Guffmiller, whose uh, bonanza that is on the first page. Uh, he's got a video channel uh, on YouTube that's very popular and he does have uh, one, one video about some somewhat, somewhat uh, dramatic guy out in the West who landed his bonanza in the Pacific Ocean uh, and the plane did not flip over. You know, he, he kept the gear up. Um, so uh, there's a pretty good, he was in a formation flight with another aircraft, which uh, got a video of this uh, ditching in the Pacific. So it's kind of worth watching. There's a New Yorker magazine story about that same pilot, the guy who ditched his Bonanza in the latest uh, New Yorker too. He's, he's irritated quite a few uh, federal uh, <laughs> national park types. So there are some some questions uh, on the chat about you know flight service versus flight following and kind of what the difference is. So um, so some of that would have been yesterday in your radar and ATC uh, service. So um, there's some slides that talk about like terminal VFR radar services. So um, essentially, basically, there's um, it's not required to talk to a flight controller um, when you're flying in most of the United States. So even if you're flying uh, from, you know, from Hanscom, Bedford, uh, down to Nantucket, uh, as long as you avoid that class Bravo airspace around Boston Logan, you don't have to be talking to anyone uh, in between the two uh, air, airport traffic, uh, ta uh, the tower controllers. So after you leave Hanscom, you could be just not talking to anybody, focusing on your own flying and navigation until you get to uh, Nantucket and then you'd wanna call Nantucket's tower to tell them that you're coming in. But it, there is a voluntary service where you can call and get flight following, for example, where that a real, you know, real air traffic controllers can talk to you, they can give you traffic advisories, you know, that there are other airplanes around, or, you know, there's parachute jumping in this area, or something like that. Um, 
they might actually tell you that they're too busy to give you that flight following. Um, so it's voluntary for them too. Um, but most of the time they'll, they'll talk to you and, you know, give you some updates as you, as you go around. Um, so someone's asking, is there any reason not to talk to air traffic control? It seems like contacting air traffic control would be the best course of action. I usually do it. I think it's a good idea, but, um, you know, it can be, it can be distracting, right? The air traffic controllers can have a lot of traffic that they're talking to that has nothing to do with you. They're talking to, you know, jets that are flying at much higher altitudes than you that aren't really, you know, pertaining to you. So it can basically clog up the whole airtime. And if you have a chunk of space where there's no one around, you've done some clearing turns, you could just hang out and look at, you know, the cranberry bogs and you don't really need to be talking to someone. But yes, I think it's a good idea. It's always great to get sources of, you know, traffic information to be safe, but it's not required. Um, and then people were talking about flight service. So this is where um, you can get some information. So there's a one of the slides in our in our deck on communication and flight navigation talked about flight service stations. So that's so when we call that number that I was talking about the 1-800 weather briefing number that's flight service. If you open a flight plan you'd be talking to flight service you'd call flight service to close your flight plan. Um, flight service can also um, talk about you know if there's a pilot that's lost they can coordinate to find that person. Um, so there is a little bit of difference between flight service and uh, flight following. Yeah, I, I put an answer for that at the end of the collaboration document. I mean, the flight service people, you might talk to them once when you open the flight plan, and then at the end of a flight, when you close the flight plan, uh, let's say you're going from uh, between untowered airports and you want to have search and rescue um, fired up if you don't uh, close your flight plan. Um, Otherwise, uh, they are not aware of what you're doing unless you call them halfway through your flight to maybe update your position uh, or uh, get, uh, get weather for your destination. Um, whereas air traffic control is tracking people in real time, either with uh, radar or when they don't have radar, they you know, use little uh, text strips and go old school to uh, figure out where people are and relying on position reports. But uh, Anyway, so, so yeah, flight service is not air traffic control to answer the specific question, different organization. And it's actually been contracted out. The air traffic controllers are, you know, FAA government workers and the flight service people now work for an independent company. Right, and I just wanted to call out um, in the chat, we're having some good conversation um, with Brian and Ellen about you know, why you might not want that flight following. So let's say there's something in your airplane you're trying to troubleshoot, or you just have a lot of workload, or you're trying to figure out what airport, air, you know, airport you're going to, or, you know, there were clouds where you were trying to go, you're going somewhere else. There's a lot of work, right? You got to focus on aviating. You got to make sure you're keeping your heading, your altitude, you're, you know, you're, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and having air traffic control constantly talking, constantly telling you to switch uh, frequency, um, can be difficult. So um, there could be some reasons why you don't do that or you don't do it continuously, you just do it part of the way. Um, the other lecture yesterday was on the UAS, unmanned uh, aircraft or um, drones as they're called. So there was a, an, a really interesting uh, lecture that talked about those types of things. So depending on the size of drone that you're flying. I mean, now you can get little tiny ones, you can fly in your own home, uh, but if you have kind of bigger ones, there's some regulations around it. You do need um, a waiver and some certification, depending on what time you're flying, how you're flying, how big it, how big it is. So um, there's a lot of regulations around it, so don't be careless or reckless. Um, we've seen some incidents where drones were seen at commercial airports and they had to close down, um, you know, Gatwick Airport because of it. They can be very dangerous. Um, so you really have to uh, keep in mind these regulations that there's actually rules around it. You can't just fly a drone anywhere. And this is where you can see a lot of those uh, regulations and this new, basically this new chapter that the FAA put out there so you can be certified to be a drone pilot. And once you get certified, then you get, you actually get a pilot's license. So 
So in fact, when we, when we polled um, you guys for taking the course, although most of you were focused on getting your private pilot's license for a single engine aircraft, many of you were actually interested in getting um, your UAS, your drone certificate, which is great. We completely support that. Uh, we encourage it. And so uh, there's some slightly different requirements here, but it's great and I would really encourage that. Any, any questions about the, the UAS or, or any other parts of the class? When doing a flight following uh, IFR, you can cancel your IFR flight following and also retry it, correct? I think you're talking about VFR. So um, when, you're on, when you're flying IFR on an official flight plan, you're required to be communicating um, with air traffic control the whole time. But for VFR, for visual flight, which is what you're talking about for just getting your private pilot's license, yes, you're absolutely right. You can cancel flight following and you can pick it up again later. Yeah, and you can cancel, you can cancel IFR. I do that all the time. I file an IFR flight plan to get out of the Washington DC airspace, which has, uh, you know, some complicated regulations that I don't feel like uh, remembering uh, for VFR flight in and out. So I just file an IFR flight plan, you know, maybe to uh, New York or Boston or wherever I feel like. And then once I'm clear of their airspace, I cancel IFR and ask them to uh, just hang on to me for uh, VFR advisories. So the assignment for today um, is, is now uh, posted. We'll make sure the website is updated um, and I'll just put it in the chat. This is this is really focused on weight and balance. And so, you know, some of the questions at the beginning of class before class started about stability of an aircraft, you know, those these types of concepts. So highly recommend uh, you take a look at that. You'll also be learning about uh, human factors, which we touched on a little bit. So while it may be legal, according to the FAA, to fly above a cloud layer, it might really confuse your senses, get, make you disoriented. So human factors is a, is a lecture. And then related to that is flying at night. So I think we've said at least 10 times through this class, it is legal to fly at night when you get your VFR, but it may not be uh, the safest or the best idea, or at least you need to be aware of some of the effects that happen, how you can get confused or disoriented. Um, so just keep keep those things in mind. And um, so, yeah, so today is day four. I don't have it highlighted, but the top, top right corner. And then the last one is aircraft ownership and maintenance. So um, yesterday there were a ton of questions about uh, aircraft maintenance. So we were talking to our guest speakers from the MIT Flying Club and, and Ted, who was talking about the, um, the aircraft that they had uh, offered to students to fly. And so there were a lot of questions about, can you maintain your own aircraft? So the, that lecture on aircraft ownership and maintenance will cover some of that. And even though you might be planning to rent your aircraft for a while, these questions are required for the FAA exam. So I do recommend you take a look at that and, and learn a little bit about that today. Let me go through a few of the questions that I've typed into the collaboration document from the chat. Uh, so we think we've already covered this a bit. If you go into a cloud inadvertently, you use your three hours of training to get back out um, by doing a 180 degree turn. Can you see a windsock at an uncontrolled airport from the air if they have no automated weather? Can you just look down and see the windsock? Yes, you're generally flying over at either a thousand feet above the ground, pattern altitude, or at 1,500 feet above the ground. So 500 feet above where other aircraft might be. Uh, and you can see the windsock pretty well. It's all designed for, uh, <clears throat> for that specifically. Uh, are there control towers at seaplane uh, bases? There's only one that I know of in the US, which is at Lake Hood up in Alaska near Anchorage International Airport. Um, do ATC and CT acronyms mean the same? I don't know what CT is. If it's control tower, then yes, uh, since control towers are part of ATC but maybe uh, the person who asked that meant something else. Uh, there's a complicated answer to, you know, can you fly drones in airspace that goes down to the surface? I guess the answer is sort of, you know, DJI will let you fly your drone when you're still technically underneath the Hanscom um, class Delta airspace, which goes to the surface. 
Um, the FAA has had some trouble with the courts because they tried to regulate hobbyist activities and uh, the courts have said, no, you're not allowed to do that. You can't, if it's an unmanned uh, aircraft, like a drone or an RC aircraft, you don't have authority to tell them what to do. Um, Tina might want to answer this by looking at the collaboration document. Somebody wanted textbooks for control systems, flight control systems, and uh, I don't have the expertise to answer that. I found you know some some journal papers, but no textbooks. Uh, yeah, so practical means for avoiding weight turbulence. You know, don't don't stress about this too much. If you're flying three whites on the Pappy, which is slightly above the glide slope, you can be 99% sure that the jet was on the glide slope. That's what jet pilots do. Um, remember, if, if they're high, then they're probably going to go off the end of the runway. <laughs> so they're, they're pretty sure to stay right on the, uh, the glide slope. Um, and uh, yeah, I didn't quite finish that answer. I'll finish this one. But yeah, you can watch them land, but it's, it, may be, it may be difficult to tell if they're floating over the runway or actually rolling on the runway. Uh, I think you can rely on them landing within the first 1,500 feet. Um, do numbers like VX and VY move around uh, as the uh, center of gravity of the aircraft moves around? Tina, I think, is better set up to answer this. I think the answer is yes, they are changed very slightly, but you don't have any data for that as a pilot from your POH, so there's nothing you can do about it. Um, that is Matt Guffmiller's plane, and he is our hero, because at age 19, he flew all the way around the world in that bonanza. Uh, if you take the class one medical and fail it, will you get a class two or three medical? Uh, the, the, the professional pilots always say don't over medical. So if you need a class two medical, don't get a class one because if a doctor hooks up the EKG to your chest and sees something that is, uh, you know, ugly, then uh, you're not going to get a medical at all. Uh, if your eyes aren't quite good enough for class one, yes, you might be able to get a class two. But uh, generally speaking, it's a bad idea to seek uh, a medical that you don't need. Um, and if you start VFR, can you file an IFR plan while uh, you're in the middle of your flight if the weather changes? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in theory, you know, they're supposed to make you give them all the information that's in the uh, flight plan form. Uh, in practice, if you're getting VFR advisories coming back from Cape Cod to Hanscom Field, and there's an overcast layer, and you just need to get down through it for an approach, you can just ask for an approach clearance and they, they won't uh, really ask you much of anything. They'll just say clear the approach and give you vectors to uh, use the instrument landing system or the uh, GPS approach. Um, all right, that's Dong it for the stuff in the chat room. Yeah, Dong has a question about, is it a good idea to, to sit in the back seat to watch a student pilot? Uh, generally, I think, yes, uh, it's a good idea. Um, it's, it's actually a great way to get some time, you know, with, at a low cost and see what it's like to see people flying, um, especially with a student pilot, that means you have an instructor, so you have someone explaining what's happening or teaching something, and so it's just like auditing a class. You can, you know, listen to the instruction, get something out of it, but uh, the one caution I would give is that um, I don't have this problem about getting uh, motion sick, but some people do. And I would caution that it's easier to get motion sick in the back of a, of a tiny airplane when you don't have the controls. And so I don't want you to take from that experience that, oh, you would feel that way if you were flying the airplane. Actually, when you are the one flying the airplane, you're, you have much less issues. So same with driving. Sometimes, you know, kids in the back seat get motion sick, but when they're actually um, you know, when you're actually driving the car, you don't have that issue. So that was the, the one caveat I would give, but yes, take advantage of all options you can have to get uh, flight training. So de the first question, does time with two students and an instructor account for both students? No, um, ah, no, I already answered it. You have to be a PIC, the pilot in command, um, you know, to be, to getting that officially logged time. All right, well, we're several minutes over now. 
So at this point, I'd request you to uh, take a look at those lectures. I've posted assignment four to the collaboration document and to the chat. So take a look at that. Um, it's really just focused on weight, weight and balance. It shouldn't be too, too difficult and uh, lots of great stuff to cover today. And tomorrow will be our final day. And then we'll give you the FA practice exam. I got a few questions about, do I have to finish the practice exam uh, by 4 p.m. Eastern tomorrow? No, we're going to give you a little bit of uh, extra time. You can take a week to complete that. But I highly recommend you go ahead and complete that right away, because right now, all the knowledge is fresh in your mind. You've just watched the lectures, done the homework, been engaged, and the the longer we wait, the more you'll, you'll just forget things. So if you want to get it out of the way, I recommend just completing that practice exam tomorrow after we post it. Thank you. All right, and um, I really appreciate, I know folks had to put up with a lot in terms of our um, dealing with different uh, sessions and IT issues. So I think about half of you are attending the later afternoon session, half of you are attending now, half of you are watching the recording. So um, I, I appreciate all the help that you guys are doing in our virtual experiment. I wanted to say bye. Well, one last question. So someone said, what advantage does taking the practice exam give again? Again, if you pass the practice exam and you post your result, then Philip, who is a CFI, can give you an endorsement, which doesn't have a time limit, so that you can go take the FAA written exam. You're not allowed to take the FAA written exam without a CFI giving you that endorsement. So that's the reason that's a big benefit uh, from taking the class is that you can get that endorsement and have that in your pocket on the way to getting your private pilot's license. All right. Thank you all. See you all later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.